My family abandoned me. 16 years later, do they want to reconcile with me? One slash. Originally, I posted this on another subreddit, but I was recommended to post it here. My intention in posting this is to vent and let off some stress. As I mentioned in the original post, the story has an ending so to speak. Again, I apologize for any mistakes that may occur or if there are gaps in the story, if you have any doubts or questions you can post them in the comments. I am not sure how much will be covered in this publication, but I will try to tell as much as possible to avoid any doubt. The content of this post is intended to provide some context about what happened between me and my family so that in the next post I can go into more depth on reuniting with my family. This story actually began 25 years ago in 1998, when I was 17 years old, I am currently 42 years old. It was during this period that I first met my now ex-wife Rachel, we both lived in a small town in central Mexico. I was in high school at the time, during the first semester I became friends with one of my classmates Lily. Lily and I got along very well from the beginning and as a result we quickly formed a good friendship. One day in between our usual conversation, Lily invited me to her house to spend some time which I agreed to. As I remember we arrived at Lily's house, spent some time doing some schoolwork and then started playing some video games. After a few minutes the door of the house opened and a few seconds later we saw a girl very similar to Lily enter the house. It turned out that Lily had a twin sister named Rachel. After seeing her for a few minutes a small conversation started between me, Lily and Rachel. After a few minutes of conversation between the three of us, Rachel and I continued the conversation alone having a good first meeting at the end. I would be lying to you if I told you that I remember everything, but by way of summary, after that first meeting I kept in touch with Rachel, we started to spend a lot of time together, we went for walks together and over time we both started to develop feelings for each other. We went on a few dates and finally formalized our courtship when we were both 19 years old. It is important to mention that Rachel is a person who suffers from two disabilities, she is blind since birth, she was diagnosed with congenital blindness, and at the age of 16 she was diagnosed with cardiac arrhythmia, this means that her heart rhythm is irregular, so there were times when her heart rate was very low. I must admit that at the beginning it was complicated to adapt to living with a disabled person, in Lily's case she only has a slight case of myopia. By my own decision and that of Rachel's family, I started to study medicine and take some courses and training to be someone capable of taking care of and guaranteeing Rachel's physical and mental safety. At that time I was studying accounting, but I was offered the opportunity to attend some courses in a medical center so I accepted. Most of the training I took was to deal with Rachel's cardiac arrhythmia, but I did it all with pleasure because I loved her and after all one does everything to see the person one loves happy and healthy. At that time Rachel was what they would call the perfect girl, physically she was beautiful and attractive. But the most remarkable thing was her personality, she was an intelligent, charismatic, empathetic, motherly, and loving person. She was truly able to endear herself to anyone she talked to and that made her somewhat popular and loved in the small town we lived in. In 2000 our courtship began while we were both in college. Our families celebrated a lot. They were very close before and knowing that there was a relationship between Rachel and me made them very happy. My mother and Rachel's mother were good friends and as for my father, he enjoyed discussing work-related issues with his mother. I always had a good relationship with her family, including being best man at her older sister's wedding. Another important point is that Rachel's father passed away when she was seven years old, but despite that he was and still is a beloved figure in her family. I thought there was nothing to worry about in terms of the family aspect at that time. My family at that time consisted of me, my parents and my three younger siblings. For a better understanding I will list my family as follows. My mother. My father. Isaac, my younger brother by one year. Louis, my younger brother by three years. Daniel, my youngest brother for four years. On Rachel's side of the family, I will list them as follows. Tanya, Rachel's mother. Sophia, Rachel's older sister. Lily, Rachel's twin sister. Rachel, now ex. Come 2003 Rachel and I graduated from college at the age of 22, we both decided to get married that same year. 
Needless to say how excited our families were to hear the news about our wedding. It was truly a very special moment for both of us, the wedding was simply perfect. From the venue, to the food, to the music. Everything we had dreamed of was present on that day. Shortly after the wedding we moved in to start our life as a couple, although for the first few days I noticed some restlessness in Rachel, at the time she told me she was just a little stressed about the wedding, her restlessness didn't last more than a day she was back to her old self very quickly. A month after the wedding something important happened which was Lily's disappearance in the family sphere, at that time Lily was working in the city bank as an accountant, being recommended by her mother for the position. Normally, we used to have drinks on Fridays after a tiring week, but one day she just didn't show up at the bar we used to go to. At first I didn't worry about it, but the following week Rishal informed me that Lily was no longer coming back. When I asked Rishal about it she wouldn't say anything about it, so I thought I would go and check with her mother. Upon questioning Tanya about this she told me that Lily was arrested last week, that she had betrayed her and her family, that she was a horrible person who had stolen and brought her family's reputation into question, that because of her actions many people would have their lives greatly harmed, etc. What you are reading is a portion of what Tanya told me. I would like to give more details, but the other things she said are already very personal. Finally, the last I heard about Lily was that she was sentenced to 13 years in prison that year. Her entire family refused to visit her and I have been forbidden to have contact with her, the rejection for her was such that her own family refused to attend the trial so that they would not be associated with her closing all communication after her sentence was passed. The next two years were fairly quiet, I started working as an accountant in a small company in the city, while Rachel worked as a teacher for blind people. My marriage was amazing. Obviously, we had some ups and downs, but it wasn't really something to worry about. We were always a communicative, loving and caring couple. Rachel being disabled limited some aspects, but we still had a good relationship emotionally and physically. Although my work consumed a lot of my time, I always tried to spend at least three hours a day with Rachel, we had one date a week and the idea of starting a family became present after a while. In 2005, I had to go on a business trip with some colleagues to close a deal that would benefit our company. The only important person in this was a former co-worker named Emma, I really had no relationship with her, being our only interaction during work. After a few days the negotiation was successful and the deal was closed. To celebrate my co-workers decided to go to a bar. The celebration was what you would expect, most of my co-workers ended up drunk, in my case, I did not get to that point limiting myself to talk with some of my colleagues on various topics. After a while I decided to go back to the hotel where we were staying. As I was leaving the place, Emma crashed into me and we both fell to the ground, like most of my companions at that moment I could see that she was drunk. I stood up again and tried to help Emma to get up, which was not possible because of the state she was in. One of my companions upon seeing this told me that it would be best to take Emma back to the hotel, I agreed and offering one of my arms as support I carried Emma back. I was really only planning to leave her in front of the door of her room and go, but in the end I had to carry her to her bed where I simply lay her down and a few seconds later I went to my room. The next day we returned to our respective homes without incident. For days after I returned from my business trip I was on my way back from work when I noticed my parents' cars, Tanya's car, outside my house. Upon entering I found Rachel's mother, her older sister and my parents standing in the living room. They all looked furious. Rachel was sitting on the couch crying, she was four weeks pregnant at this point. Without having time to process the scene, I received a loud slap from Sophia, which was followed by several screams from those present. I questioned why everyone was acting this way and finally Rachel spoke up and all she said was why did you do that, I asked her what she meant by that and quickly everyone started yelling at me and accusing me of cheating on Rachel during my business trip. I questioned them where that accusation came from, to which Tanya said that Emma approached her to say that I supposedly had an affair with her, that I supposedly had for some time an emotional affair with her that during the trip transitioned to a physical affair, apparently Emma was very detailed in her story that she managed to pass off her lie as true. She also mentioned that she had supposedly said very cruel things about Rachel related to her condition among other things. I told them that Emma was lying and there wasn't something to prove what she said, 
but Sophia replied that they asked everyone who went on the trip with us, all agreeing that they saw me go with Emma back to the hotel alone, this point is true, but it's because no one wanted to help me take Emma back to her room. I begged Rachel to believe me, but she responded that she wanted nothing more to do with me asking for a divorce, the yelling and insults towards me continued until I was kicked out of my house. The following months were total hell, I was forced to quit my job when everyone found out what was going on. Because we lived in a small town, most people knew each other, so you get an idea of the hatred I received throughout that time with everyone yelling insults at me with sometimes escalating to physical assaults. My parents told me I was a disgrace to the family, my siblings disowned and insulted me, Rishel's family likewise did the same to everyone refusing to have any kind of relationship with me. I thought of turning to those who were my friends, but I was also rejected by them. In this period of time I must highlight the behavior of my brother Louis who made suspicious comments about what was happening, I later learned that he was the one who comforted Rishel during the divorce process. The divorce process lasted about a year in which I was not allowed to have contact with Rachel at any time, all contact was through her lawyer, finally in 2006 the process ended with me losing almost everything due to the nature of the situation. Where I lived adultery is considered something serious, so in addition to having to pay alimony I had to pay financial compensation, among other things, but my lawyer got an agreement not to have to pay alimony. In the end I had to give my house my car, 80% of my savings and a compensation of $160,000. Once the divorce was finalized, both my family and Rachel's family cut off all contact with me, the last I heard about them being that my brother Louis and Rachel started a relationship. At that point I had basically lost everything. I lost my family, my friends, my reputation, everything. No one wanted to relate to me so it was impossible for me to get a job, I was marginalized by everyone who lived in that city. To go on with my life made no sense, so I thought about ending it all, but in the end I didn't have the courage to do it. Finally, I decided to sell what little I had to raise some money and I finally left that place. I moved to a city that was six hours away from where I lived before, my goal was to be as far away as possible, so I moved to a city in the northern part of Mexico. Finally, I arrived in another state. I didn't have much money at the time, so I took small jobs to raise some money. A few months after starting my new life, I noticed that several businesses in the area where I lived required guidance and assistance related to filing taxes and performing audits. I saw this as a new opportunity, so I began to give advice and consultations related to tax returns and the correct performance of audits. In 2007 I was able to form a small and somewhat successful consulting and economic advice company, but at that time I had serious emotional problems, being mostly confidence and self-esteem issues. Once I was able to reach economic stability again I had the opportunity and the means to take therapy, it really helped me a lot to finally be able to deal with my emotional problems. With my therapist I addressed several issues, my relationship with my family, my relationship with my friends and my relationship with my ex-wife, at the time I felt that I was somewhat to blame for what happened, mostly I felt like an idiot for not having suspected anything about Emma, and I also questioned why all this happened with Emma. In the end I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of the experience I lived through during the divorce, but the most serious thing was that I developed an anxiety disorder that affected me greatly when socializing with other people, at that time I was unable to form any kind of relationship with people because of my fear of being betrayed. It was a slow process, but I managed to get through it. I understood that I was not to blame for what happened, I was able to start the healing process and I stopped questioning Emma's motive for lying. I was physically and mentally well. I started going to the gym, developed a love for gardening and kickboxing and focused on my work. I even started to make some friends and after a while I was confident enough to go out for a few drinks. The next two years were pretty good for me. My small company had a good growth, so money was no longer a problem, I was not a millionaire or something similar, but I earned enough to not have to worry. Emotionally I was fine. My confidence problems were no longer so serious and my fear of relating to other people was disappearing although it was still somewhat present. I was able to meet my current friends who were very understanding about my situation and I was finally able to be okay with myself. 2009 was an important year. Due to the growth that my company was having, I had to look for more personnel, 
among those personnel I was looking for accountants for the company. As I was reviewing some of the job applications, one of them stood out above the rest. The application was from a Lily that surprised me a bit as that reminded me of my old friend, but at the time I thought it was just a coincidence. Finally, I had the interview with the person who sent the application and great was my surprise to see that it was really the Lily I knew, we both recognized each other instantly and remained silent, honestly it was something uncomfortable, since she was my ex-wife's twin, several painful memories came back to my mind when I saw her face. After a few minutes I continued with the interview in the most normal way I could, in the end I must admit it was a good interview. Finally, Lily got one of the positions and a few days later she showed up to start working, regardless of what happened in the past, Lily was one of the best options, so it would be stupid not to hire someone with a great experience and knowledge in the area. In addition, her job application did not mention any criminal record, so there was no problem hiring her. In the beginning, communication between Lily and I was nil, limited to work-related interactions, including her interactions with other employees. During this period, Lily just showed up to work, did her job, and went home without any contact with anyone. Lily continued this behavior for a few more months. One day an important project came up for the company, which meant more work and therefore more hours of work. At the end of the work schedule I used to stay overtime to advance some of the pending work, then Lily volunteered to help with the pending work to which I accepted. Most of those extra hours passed with both of us being in total silence, until one day Lily invited me to have a drink, Lily seemed very nervous and a bit scared when I made the proposal. At first I had no intention of accepting her invitation, but at that moment I was very stressed, so a drink would not go amiss. Actually the little outing was not very remarkable, but overall it was quite nice to spend time with her, we talked about work-related issues. After a while Lily started to gain more confidence, so we got closer little by little until we started to form a formal friendship again, which grew over time. After work was over we would sometimes spend time talking, we would share our lunch break and on Fridays we would go for a few drinks like in the old days. On one of our outings to the bar I decided to be open with her and tell her everything that happened with me and Rishal, Lily had previously asked about how Rishal was doing to which I just said that we got divorced without talking about why, I told her what happened with Emma and how everything went during the divorce proceedings. At that moment Lily was surprised by everything that had happened, to which I asked her if a lie was really enough for our families to cut off contact with me. I replied that I did not know all the details, so I did not know if there was something else that led them to take that position. For her part Lily was very upset and asked if one lie was enough to overshadow the years I spent with our families, finally she said she would be there for me if I needed to talk again. Up to that point I had only talked in depth about my divorce issue with my therapist, so letting it all out took a huge weight off my back. Overall, Lily was a great addition to the company, managing to stand out and rise quickly within the company despite her time in prison, but despite this something was not right with her. I noticed how Lily's problems working as part of a team or with other employees were still present. So on one of our drinks outings I asked her if everything was okay, when I asked the question Lily seemed nervous and scared, so I apologized for asking the question, but I told her the same thing she told me when I told her about my divorce. I told her that if she needed to talk to someone she could count on me. The next few days went by as normal, until on one of our outings to the bar, Lily finally decided to open up to me. She told me about what happened in the past and why she was arrested. In a somewhat, summarized and simplified way, Lily worked at the bank in the city where we both lived before, she explained to me that her duties at the bank were to perform the annual startup of the accounting system in addition to working on budget allocations, budget items, projects, etc. Because Lily proved to be a very efficient and capable element, the people in charge of the bank assigned her to a position where she had access to a large database containing all the information about the clients and people who had an account in the bank to perform her duties in a better way. In addition to Lily, there was also another guy who had the same duties as her. He said that one day the administration was bombarded by complaints from angry people who reported that their savings accounts were zero or that they had no money in their bank accounts at all. 
After a few hours the bank's administration realized that the bank accounts of several people were indeed being emptied, after a few hours and since there was nothing that could solve the problem, they were forced to restrict access to all associated accounts resulting in what we know in Mexico as a Coralito, this means that for a few days no one could enter or withdraw money from their accounts, which was very problematic. When investigating what happened, the cause of the problem was found. It turned out that a criminal group, it is most likely that these people were members of some cartel of the time, but this was not made clear, had access to the information stored in the database, by information I mean card numbers, passwords, etc., so that having this information they dedicated themselves to emptying several bank or savings accounts. The bank managed to recover some of the stolen money, but some of it could not be recovered. Most of those involved were arrested two days after the event, but others managed to escape. Lily was taken into custody while the investigation was ongoing. The people who had access to the database were investigated, leaving Lily and her co-worker as the only suspects, but the latter could not be investigated further because he curiously resigned a few days before the event and disappeared from the city. The perpetrators stated that someone who worked at the bank gave them access to the information stored in the database, but that they did not know who it was because contact with this person was made by another member of this group who managed to escape. The investigation also showed that this group had to be guided by someone who had knowledge about the operation of the bank. Because of these and other factors that were presented, it was suggested that Lily was the one who helped these people, in the end she was found guilty, although perhaps she was only used as a scapegoat to close the case, which would not surprise me considering the history of the Mexican police and this type of things. Then she told me how her family turned their back on her during the whole period of the investigation. I highlight her mother, who did not believe her at any time about her innocence, at this time there was some tension between Lily and her mother for situations related to their relationship, it seems that this fact complicated things. Finally, Tanya threw in her face the damage that her action had caused to both her family's reputation and the people who lost their savings, when her sentence was passed her mother went to her for the last time to tell her that they did not want to see her again in their lives to which Lily returned to say that she was innocent with her mother replying, if you were found guilty it is for something, right? Soon after her family cut all contact with her, leaving her completely devastated. As soon as Lily finished speaking I began to apologize to her for not being with her when I needed to be, to which she replied that I did not have to apologize, because even if I had wanted to communicate, Tanya would not have allowed me to do so, Tanya was the only one allowed to visit Lily in prison so if anyone wanted to visit her they had to have her permission to do so. Besides this Tanya also prevented contact by other means such as correspondence and phone calls. After a few minutes I asked Lily how she managed to get out of prison, to which she replied that she was imprisoned for five years until one of the people who managed to escape was arrested. It turned out that this person was in charge of having contact with the person who gave access to the database to this group, in exchange for reducing her sentence, she agreed to give information about the fraud and how it was carried out. Ultimately, her statements proved that it was Lily's former partner who helped this group, coupled with the lack of evidence to genuinely validate Lily's participation in the scheme. In the end it was ruled that there was no reason for Lily to remain in prison, so she was released and any criminal record on her record was expunged. She said that after her release she tried to contact her family, but in the end she was only able to contact her mother, who again refused to have any relationship with her. The same thing happened with her friends, who rejected her. She told me about her attempts to get a job, but the news of what happened in her previous job prevented her from getting a position in her hometown and in nearby cities. Finally, Lily left the city as there was no reason to stay there. After that she spent a few months looking for a job and ended up coming to my company. She says that because of what she had to go through she has trouble relating to other people, in addition to having trust issues and constant nightmares because of her time in prison. At that moment I felt bad for her, she had to go through and deal with several things that in one way or another will leave her with lifelong traumas. I recommended that she attend therapy to deal with these issues, I told her that I would pay for everything as a way of apologizing for my absence when she needed us the most. She refused at first, but after some time of insistence she agreed, so she began to attend the same therapist I was attending, but she asked me to accompany her to the therapy session. 
She was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress syndrome, depression, anxiety and confidence disorders and sleeping problems. For the first few months that I accompanied her to her therapy sessions, I used to wait for her outside the office while she took the session individually. But eventually she asked me to come in and accompany her during her sessions to which I agreed. The therapist prescribed her some antidepressants and she began going to therapy two days a week. Lily also began attending a healing program for conscientious objectors who have served time in prison. For my part, the therapist gave me a number of pointers to help with Lily's recovery. Although Lily's recovery was slow, I can say that it really helped. Her fear of interacting with other people was disappearing to the point where she was making friends, her anxiety and trust issues were no longer a concern. In general she started to change for the better, we even both started going to the gym together and Lily started taking kickboxing classes with me, sometimes we had friendly fights between us. The year 2012 arrived. During this period Lily and I became closer and closer. In the work aspect we had a good relationship with Lily, becoming my right hand in the company. On the personal side we also had a very good relationship, we spent more and more time together, going out for a drink or a walk became part of our routine and we both leaned on each other during our therapy. As time went on I realized that I had developed feelings for Lily. I know what you may be thinking right now, did you fall in love with the twin of the woman who left you? For a while the idea of having a relationship scared me because of my experience with Rachel. I was afraid that my fear was clouding my judgment or that my trust issues would ruin any chance of a relationship. I was also afraid that the reason I started liking Lily was that I was unconsciously looking to get back with my ex and considering they were both almost the same, you get my point. By almost the same I only mean that the only thing they shared was the face, in other aspects they were totally different. By other aspects I mean, personality, way of acting, way of dressing, etc. After consulting my doubts with my therapist and my friends, I was able to confirm that I was really in love with Lily, I was falling in love with her person and not her appearance. Finally, I waited for our next outing to the bar to declare my feelings to her, I waited until we left the bar and declared how I felt about her, I explained how special I felt when I was by her side and how I only thought about spending time with her. Lily was quiet for a few minutes, then she started to cry a little and asked me if I was sure about what I was saying, at that moment I thought I had screwed everything up and was just waiting to be rejected. I reaffirmed my stance on my feelings for her, to which she formed some distance, but a few seconds later she hugged me. Between sobs she confessed to me that she felt the same way, confessed that she began to develop feelings for me when she saw how much I cared and cared for her. She said that I was the first person who genuinely cared for her in a long time, that I was the only one to support her when she needed it most, that I was the only one who has come to understand her, she confessed that when she is with me she feels that she is not alone, she told me that when she is with me she feels that a good life is possible, she told me that I gave her a reason to keep living, that I made her feel loved. At this point I was crying too. Lily continued to cry as she hugged me. She told me that she hadn't said anything about how she felt because she was afraid, she was afraid that I wouldn't love her because of what happened with her sister, she was afraid that I wouldn't love her because of her problems, she was afraid that I would take her away from her, she was afraid that she would be alone again. At that moment I began to comfort her and promised her that I would be by her side no matter what happened. Lily, for her part, also promised to be by my side, no matter what. From that moment on Lily and I began our relationship. At first it was somewhat complicated because of the problems we both had, mostly due to our trust issues and fear of betrayal. But we decided that we would not let our past stop us from being happy. Although it was a somewhat slow process, with some tense moments we managed to build a good bond, this bond was what gave us the mental clarity and strength to take the final steps that allowed us to heal. Finally, Lily and I got married in early 2015. We both decided it would be best to have a small event, so we only invited the people closest to us. For those of you wondering no, we did not invite our families. The idea was discussed and consulted with our therapist, but in the end we decided not to invite them because it didn't make sense to do so because of everything that happened between us. The wedding took place on a beautiful beach, the atmosphere created by the sound of the sea and the sunset was something very unique and special. A total of 15 people attended the event, 
All of them were very close friends of ours and even our therapist attended with his wife. One of the best memories I have of the wedding was seeing Lily walk down the aisle, seeing her in her wedding dress was something I will never forget. But the moment I will treasure the most for the rest of my life was seeing her face as I put the ring on, everything we both had to go through to get to this moment. Seeing that beautiful smile on Lily's face, I just don't know how to describe in words how it made me feel. A few weeks after the wedding we found out that Lily was pregnant, you know, a honeymoon pregnancy. I admit that at first we were very nervous, but as the days went by the nerves turned into excitement and happiness. We took the pregnancy as the beginning of our new life together. At the end of 2015, Lily gave birth to a beautiful baby girl whom I will refer to as Alba. Luckily at the hospital where the birth occurred, we were allowed to have skin-to-skin -skin contact with Alba as soon as she was born. Holding my baby was a special moment, a unique moment when I met my daughter, seeing her in my wife's arms, I simply would not know how to explain in words how I felt at that moment. What sentimentality and what truth? I don't think it is necessary to say what the arrival of Alba generated in our lives both on a personal and social level, our friends visited us every day to meet Alba. I must say that the first few months were difficult, people who have had or cared for a baby know that babies need a lot of time and attention, so it is normal to feel overwhelmed or tired. The baby's cries, having to stay up all night, preparing bottles at 4 o'clock in the morning, etc. It was a complicated period, but we were able to cope with it, in a good way. We made an effort to give all the affection and love we had for our daughter despite the physical and mental exhaustion we were subjected to. As the years went by, Lily and I worked hard to ensure that Alba had a good upbringing from a young age. We dedicated ourselves to creating a loving, respectful, and trusting environment for her to thrive. Despite the fact that we both worked, we usually organized ourselves to spend time with our little girl. With this we come to the present day, today I can tell you that I am the proud father of a beautiful seven-year-old girl and that I have the best wife I could wish for. As you have been able to read during my publication it has not been an easy road, there have been good and bad moments throughout these years. But I wouldn't change a thing, I have great people by my side and I couldn't wish for anything more. If you are wondering, yes there is more history. Since last year both me and Lily have had contact with our families, but I didn't mention anything, as I feel that the publication is already too long. Sincerely, I thank you for the support that the first publication had, although it was deleted, I would like to tell what happened regarding our families and the current situation with them. So I hope that the publication will continue to exist so I can update it with the events that happened in 2022 and so far in 2023.